Our next speaker will be uh, Dr. Jennifer Tseng, uh, who's a board certified surgical oncologist and assistant professor of surgery. Dr. Tseng earned her medical degree from the University of California at Davis and completed her general surgery residency at Oregon Health and Science University. She later received fellowship training in clinical immunology, immunotherapy at the National Cancer Institute and general surgical oncology training at the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Seng is a senior fellow with the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and previously served as a theme issue editor for the Amer American Medical Association's Journal of Ethics. Her research interests include ethical considerations in clinical trials, the use of surrogate decision makers, and prophylactic surgery. Dr. Seng integrates the latest research in clinical trials in caring for patients with breast cancer, melanoma, and sarcoma. She's a prior national resident representative for the Surgery Residency Review Committee of the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education and is an Associate Program Director for the General Surgery Residency and Complex General Surgical Oncology Fellowship. She's also an education scholar with the American Society of Clinical Oncology and is currently pursuing a master's in health, professional educa health professions education with the University of Illinois at Chicago. Today, Dr. Seng will present a paper entitled Prevalence of Decisional Incapacity and Surrogate Decision-Making in Hospitalized Patients. Jennifer Tseng. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you Dr. Siegler and the Buxbaum Institute for the opportunity to showcase our work. This is part of the work I did as a McLean uh, Center Fellow uh, under the guidance of Dr. Siegler as well. So um, I have no relevant disclosures. So the key points that I want you to take away is actually this was the first study to quantify prevalence of decisional incapacity and the extent of surrogate decision making in the inpatient setting. And we actually did interviews of internal medicine and surgery healthcare providers here at U, uh, University of Chicago and the Mayo Clinic in Rochester to actually uh, attain this uh, number to be able to work with. So we actually found that 15% of inpatients lack decisional incapacity or lacked decisional capacity at any given time point, and 85% had an identifiable surrogate decision maker. Uh, so a little bit of background, as we know, it's an aging, sicker population that we have in the U.S. So this is becoming an increasingly important uh, issue for us to tackle. Um, myself as a surgeon, I've always wondered about that value of how many surgical patients are floating around the hospital, um, not really understanding or are, are they consentable and so we've never had that number available to us in the surgical literature there's actually a little bit more in the um, acute care hospital setting for medicine patients that I'll go over in just a little bit um, so prior data has been available and published on subsets of populations uh, that have been hospitalized in the acute care setting and that's in older patients cancer patients the terminally ill and those with psychiatric comorbidities um, the main study that that we drew from is one that was published in Lancet that actually looked at the prevalence of mental incapacity giving uh, many mental uh, exams. And uh, they actually looked at a population of 300 patients that were admitted in a hospital in the United Kingdom. And they actually found that 40% of those patients at any given time lacked uh, decisional capacity. But there's really no comparable estimate that I can find um, for hospitalized patients in the United States. And that's an increasingly important number for us to focus on in advanced care planning. Uh, so our objective was actually to determine the prevalence of decisional incapacity in hospitalized patients in the United States, drawing from um, my ability to work here at the University of Chicago, and we actually had a McLean Fellow at that same time who's coming from uh, Mayo Clinic as a Palm Critical Care Fellow who's currently on faculty there. So this was IRB exempted at both of our institutions, and we actually ended up doing interviews of healthcare provider representatives from uh, teams in internal medicine and surgery. Uh, he, at both institutions. So we uh, took a healthcare representative as being the primary um, 
a person who could actually let us know after morning rounds how many patients they had and to speak about their patients' uh, decisional capacity. So these healthcare representatives were either residents, attending physicians, physician assistants, or advanced practice nurses. And for the most part, I would say that we actually contacted attending providers vast majority of the time on internal medicine services at both institutions. Um, actually, at both institutions, it was mainly uh, mid-level providers that we were able to contact after morning rounds, oftentimes because attending surgeons and residents were in the operating room. So that was an interesting finding in terms of who was able to give us additional information. And we gathered information on ward patients as well as ICU patients. So the questions that we asked was, how, um, what is the number of patients that the provider was caring for on that date? the number of patients that the patient, uh, the provider considered to lack decisional capacity. And of the patients who lack decisional capacity, how many had a surrogate decision maker? And this was either a surrogate decision maker that the healthcare um, provider representative knew was named by the patient while the patient was still decisional or was chosen by the team as a default or convenient sur surrogate. And so there was a total of 423 inpatients on a given date that we did all these interviews at University of Chicago, and there were 610 inpatients on the date that they chose to do it, uh, their interviews. And they were done on separate dates just for logistical reasons, um, but a single point in time. And there was uh, over 1,000 patients that we captured in our analysis. And so in terms of looking at the total number of inpatients, um, there were generally a smaller number of surgical patients than medicine patients, uh, and the Mayo Clinic had a larger sample for us to draw from. In terms of medicine inpatients, those who lacked decisional capacity, it actually been, ended up being pretty co comparable estimates, 14% here and 15% at Mayo. And then of those who had a surrogate decision maker, uh, actually um, it was 13% uh, from the total number of inpatients, but as you can see, it was 35 out of 37 patients patients actually had a surrogate decision maker. And then um, in, at Mayo, it was 47 out of 55. So actually a really good percentage for us to um, pay attention to. And then in terms of the surgery population of inpatients, um, the percentage dipped a little bit in terms of uh, the patients that the providers categorized as lacking decisional capacity. And then the percentage was also a little bit lower in terms of um, the provider knowing that the patient had a surrogate decision decision maker. So we uh, subsetted this out in terms of thinking about ICU patients. So there were 60 ICU patients at University of Chicago on that date that we did interviews and 90 at the Mayo Clinic for a total of 150 patients. And then um, uh, those who lack decisional capacity, we actually found a higher percentage as we expect. 40% uh, of patients in the ICUs at University of Chicago lack decisional capacity as um, determined by the primary healthcare representative for that team on the ICU versus 32% at Mayo Clinic. And actually, uh, the number who had surrogate decision makers also uh, was again high. Um, there were less patients in the surgery ICUs um, in general, mainly because of the denominator was a little bit smaller too, um, but also around that 40%. And then also finding that um, about the same number had uh, surrogate decision makers. We also looked at additional issues like, um, such as which patients the healthcare provider representative knew had advanced care planning documentation, such as advanced directives, and pulse. And uh, there was the vast majority of medicine inpatients actually had these documentations. But the number actually of surgery patients who had these documents at University of Chicago was very high. And at Mayo Clinic, those surgery patients actually, it, that percentage dropped substantially. And we don't have great explanation for that, but that was interesting to know. And that may, we actually hypothesize offline that maybe it has to do with us having the McLean Center here focused on those issues and providers here that are very aware of those issues and medical students who have clinical ethics training. Um, so some of the points for discussion that came up was how and to what extent was decisional capacity defined? 
So this was, uh, we left it open to the healthcare provider representative to define for a reason. This is, we thought this was a little more real life, but um, there are some critiques of this that we didn't do formal assessments. Um, and then why is the study prevalence so much different than the prior prevalence reported? It is interesting to note that actually um, our ICU percentage was much more comparable to their overall inpatient percentage. But this often is taken into account by different uh, hospital settings, uh, different patient populations. Um, there's probably a multi uh, multitude of factors that we can go into. Um, definitely, our study is limited by recall bias, some of the definitions regarding decisional capacity in the first place. This was a single time point, and patient censuses uh, do vary at each institution per seasonal changes and uh, various uh, time points for other reasons. And neither of the institutions had step-down units as well. So it was either an acute care patient or an ICU patient. Um, as defined. Um, but we thought this was helped by the fact that we did two institutions to account for some institutional variation. Um, and it did demonstrate what healthcare providers believe to be their decisional, uh, their patient's decisional uh, making capacity or incapacity at any given time point. And so this may be actually a much more realistic reflection of what the providers are thinking about their patients um, on a given day in a busy practice as well in the inpatient setting. Um, so uh, the just the overall takeaway numbers that I had in my head um, was that 15% of inpatients, at least at these two institutions, lack decisional capacity, much higher percentage in of ICU patients as we had expected. Um, but actually, a fair amount of patients had um, advanced care planning documentation, which was very encouraging. This is obviously a very preliminary effort to learn about decisional incapacity, and really more complex and rigorous studies need to be performed for better um, quantification of this. So uh, again, thank you to Buxbaum Institute, Angela, um, Dr. Siegler, of course, Dr. Peter Angelos, who's not here, who's one of my primary mentors for ethics, all the co-authors who um, there was a lot of labor in terms of doing these interviews. Um, and then, of course, uh, especially Andrew Hentel and then Aaron DiMartino's, the, um, my um, colleague at Mayo. And of course, the departments of medicine and surgery at both institutions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you were to do this study again, how would you consider that particular limitation? How would you change your study? Yeah, the problem is also time limitation. There's very little time that oftentimes we can capture if we're trying to really capture a whole patient census. Like, um, they, they would require much more time intensive, I feel like, um, actual ability to sit down with the provider, uh, providers or even interview the patients themselves, actually, for more rigorous methodology. Um, so this was really a, a ability to get a quick snapshot. But I do agree, like, the ideal would be actually even doing um, the decisional incapacity, like uh, evaluations or assessments on patients themselves, um, actually giving a much more rigorous definition to healthcare providers to draw from as well is actually very key. So there's multiple ways that this could be done um, in a much more uh, uniform fashion in terms of the definition of for decisional incapacity. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, so I appreciate that you mentioned that it's a yeah. limitation, and I, I agree with Stacey. I think there's a lot more that can be done. So I would also encourage you to consider screening tools and or, because I'm, I'm curious as to some of the questions that you posed in, in the interview when it comes to recall. Because recall is really memory, and we know decision capacity is for different domains. Yeah. So just to encourage you that there are screens out there with different like that, things yeah. you can do in the inpatient setting, and there's a real host for the spectrum of patients that you're seeing. So yeah. No, and like this was uh, this was accounted for by this is actually what we wanted. The objective was really to know what providers think uh, is actually the prevalence of decisional incapacity and in their particular it's really teams. Difficult because I think when it comes to decisional capacity, so I work in a cancer setting, so that decisional capacity at one point in time is going to be completely different. Once Correct. For example, their pain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if Correct. they're hospitalized, are they just mm -hmm. immediately? 
So I think even finding that kind of window to talk to providers at, at, at different times across the board during the, the hospital is actually important. Yeah, and, there, and there has been literature like that, so we we'll really mm -hmm. encourage you to no, I definitely agree. I think this is like a little, the main question is, what is the prevalence at any given time that there's so? So, so if you actually, do, so that was, I definitely did consider that in terms of trying to build this in terms of the interviews, but we were literally trying to get one date, one time point, what it is that we thought in the whole census that we could capture on a feasible scale, what it might be. I agree, the, a patient's mental status and decisional capacity changes throughout a course of a hospitalization. I take care of surgery patients. That's definitely true. Um, so, but I think that's why it was designed this way. But there's a lot of limitations in terms of, you know, the do a lot of nuance there. We try to account for the recall bias by immediately contacting all the providers right after rounds when they had just seen the patients and they had actually just visited their census too, where they literally had interacted with the patients, but that also has limitations in itself. So I definitely agree with all it's the points. Mm -hmm. study, yes. Okay. And the last previous study was that study in the Lancet? The Lancet. 20 years earlier? Yeah, in terms of trying to capture a whole census in the yeah. hospital. There's definitely a lot of uh, work on subsets, mainly because this is a very time-intensive, resource-intensive ability to be able to capture all this in a, in a busy hospital setting. Um, but I don't think that should dissuade us from actually trying to get that number. It's just, it's, it is a very interesting way. Like there's m multiple methodologies to probably capture this better it's on a future number, studies. It's a number that's likely to increase mm -hmm. because of the age of the population and how sick people are when they're coming into hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much.